Open your Bibles to Romans 16. We're gonna, those of you who went to Saturday who are going to share something, you're going to share within the message. And, um, and so that's kind of cool. And everything I said, I want you to remember everything we just talked about uh, locally, internationally, all that stuff. I go to Romans 16. My guess is, although you people are really sharp, but I'm not sure I have ever heard anybody teach out of Romans chapter 16. This is very similar to teaching out of uh, Matthew 1, which is the begats, which I have taught also out of the begats. I like that as well. Uh, so Romans chapter 16 is a great chapter of the Bible that it's not great unless you see it as great. All Paul is doing in Romans chapter 16 is listing 26 people by name at the end of a letter as if he's signing off and say, wow, I love you all. Oh, by the way, say hi to 26 people. I'm out of here. Hope to see you in a few years. That's what Romans 16 is. But I want you to see something in here that if we can get a hold of it, it can Man, I'm stoked about today because of what can happen as a result of today. It's so practical what's going on today. I want to, I want to just touch on a few things of this. I want to get some young people up here. I want to come back to this. And you absolutely have homework that you have to do today or else God will get you. <laughs> there it gets you. Romans chapter 16. Father, teach us what it is to love people. Teach us what it is to know that we are completely interdependent. Dependent upon you and interdependent upon people. Amen. Amen. We're in the thank you series. Last week, give thanks. This week, thank you, part two. Um, I got really creative with this title. It's thank you, part two. Um, and, but let me share with you the Apostle Paul. If you had to rate... Uh, whatever, great Christians in the New Testament, Paul's really at the top of your list. Uh, you could even make a case, I am not, but you could make a case his influence was greater than Jesus' influence. This guy had influence. You actually can say that because Jesus actually said we would do greater work. So it's not minimizing Jesus. It's showing what somebody... Paul was incredible. The magnitude, the number of people... He was on multiple continents. He broke ground in here. He saw miracle after miracle. He preached. He was, you know, he's just pretty awesome. And so at the end of the book of Romans, he's dictating this letter. And he is writing, uh, he's, he's probably, most people think he's in, in the, the city of Corinth. And he's hoping to get to Rome. And he hasn't gotten there yet. And he's wanting to get there. So he's writing a letter to Rome, uh, to, the, to the church in Rome, and is sharing with them. Really, I mean, it's great teaching. He's, he's, you know, he's sending a whole course over there, basically. And then at the end, he's sending personal greetings. I love this because this is the top dog in all of Christianity. And one sixteenth of the book of Romans is personal greetings. Why do I like that? Because I like people. And I don't like people as a whole. I like people as an individual. I like you and you and you and you and you, each of you. If I could say your names, I would. I like you. I actually can tell some people their birthdays and not their name. So that's just a weird thing that happens in my brain. Um, but he sends personal, let me read them. And I just want you to catch the heart of thankfulness that's in Paul. He says, I commend to you, this is he's writing to the, the people in Rome. He says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church in Centria. Th that, what that is, is that's the port city near Corinth. So it's another city. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and to give her any help she may need from you for she has been a great help to many people including me so paul's going to go into this signing off of 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 thing he wasn't writing on something that he could just print page after page of so every word mattered you got to hear this every word mattered he was sending a letter he wasn't sending 152 copies of this letter. He was sending a letter. Everything was written carefully. And he said, very important for him to say, take care of Phoebe. Who's Phoebe? I'm not really sure. I do know this. 
She was really cool. She was really helpful. She was a leader in the church, probably a deacon. Some of the wording in there seems to say she was. She was a significant person. She was, she was heading to Rome on official business from Paul. Paul trusted her with the literal letter. Imagine if you had the only copy ever to the book of Romans. This, this book's going to go big. If you drop this in the water, gone. Phoebe was taking it. Paul said, Phoebe's awesome. He said, man, I'm really thankful for Phoebe. And he goes on to say, oh, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of Gentiles are grateful for them. Priscilla and Aquila, a husband and wife, were pretty great. These people also made tents. They were business owners. Uh, they seemed to actually have a, a, you know, even some, some resources and some money was involved with their life. And they were strong partners of Paul. They worked to help people like Apollos and they discipled people. They were key people. Paul would go out, preach up a storm, take rocks to the head, get snake bites and get healed from it. And he was like, wild, let's follow him around because things happen when Paul shows up. And when Paul got a hold of somebody who needed some help, he said, you know what? Go see Pr Priscilla and Aquila. Nobody was writing stories about Priscilla and Aquila because they were a little bit dull. The person who counsels somebody and gets their life completely straightened out, isn't that exciting? Paul's exciting. You know what Paul said? Man, I need my fellow workers, Priscilla and Aquila. He had to have them. He says, man, thank you, God, for these people. And he goes on to say, greet also the church that meets at their home. Again, where, there's actually a few different cities where Priscilla and Aquila lived where the church met in their home. So either they moved and bought a house different places or they owned a lot of houses. And all the houses they owned were large enough to, to house, you know, whatever, 50 or 100 people or whatever would be there. Then he says, greet my dear friend Epinetus who was the first convert of Christ in the province of Asia. How cool is it that Paul remembered the first convert in Asia? You know, I don't know how many people Paul saw saved. Thousands, thousands. What was this guy's name? I forgot it from here to there. Epin Epinetus. Nobody names their kids after these people. What's the deal? Should have named Ep We get the Rufus. That's a cool name. Um, Phoebe. We get a little Phoebe going on. The, the, uh, but Epinetus, Paul remembers. He remembers the first person saved in Asia. His fond memories. It would be so easy for the great evangelist Paul to just remember a sea of people. He doesn't remember the mass of people. He remembers Epinetus. I bet you he remembers other people too. This is the first. Probably then therefore became the leader because if you're in a town that's never been, uh, there's nobody become a Christian, you become a Christian and then you're the first convert. So therefore you are the veteran. And then, you know, the next day, 10 p other people get saved. Well, who do we talk to? Well, let's talk to Epinetus. He's been a Christian a long time, a day. And he becomes a leader and he raises up. And so, but Paul remembers Epinetus. Why? Because Paul was thankful for individual people. Individual people. I want God to stir our hearts to remember individual people and be thankful for individual people. Real people, real faces, real issues, real problems, real people who get us through lives. A linking, a partnership. A fellow worker. I love that word partner. Paul uses it. He uses fellow worker. Uh, same word, basically. A partner. What is a partner? A good partner is somebody who can fill, has a common vision as you and fills in the gaps that you have. You have gaps. You have to have gaps. You have to have holes in you. You have to. You got to have problems. You got to have areas of weakness. We should embrace those areas. Why? Because it means we're part of a body. 
See, as we get farther away from a body and think we're out there on our own, we therefore think that we have no weaknesses. The farther away from people I get, the more I think I'm great. If I take another step away from you, I think I have a little bit greater. One more step, I'm greater. One more step, I'm greater. I get over here and I'm like, whoo, I'm great. What's wrong with all you? Oh my Lord, help us to not do that. And I was not symbolically talking about our worship singers who are back there. Because like AJ's like, oh my gosh, that, Kurt, I was right where you, where'd you go? I was right by your spot. Uh, so I'm not, but I'm telling you, we must have partnerships. That's why it's so important to be part of a body. It's uniqueness. If you look at your body, there's so many odd things about your body. And you're like, why this? Why that? Who knows that? And all that stuff. But as you study the literal body, you find out that everything has a place. Everything has a function. And when you embrace that within the body of Christ, if somebody were to say to me, Rick, what are your needs? What weaknesses? I could say this truthfully. I have no weaknesses because I am entrenched in the body of Christ. How about that? Do we, could we really say that? I, I think I should be able to because I'm in the body of Christ. I have no needs. He says, I've given every spiritual blessing, every spiritual gift, everything you need for life and godliness I've poured out into the body of Christ. And as long as I'm into the body of Christ, I have it all. On my own, I got a pile of needs. But within the body of Christ, I am covered. And so Paul had that view for individual people that the, he was really, he knew that his weaknesses, this Epinetus filled and Timothy filled and Barnabas filled and John Mark filled and Gaius filled and, and all these other people here that I'm probably not going to read, they filled them. And, and, and it's just this, as long as we're thankful for the individual people and, and thankful for what God is doing, and when we're within that, great things can happen. When we have a perspective on all the different, all the disparity, please hear this. I know I say it a lot, but we've got to get a hold of it. Never think, never think that diversity is bad. Diversity is good. It's so good. Unity is not uniformity. We do not want everybody to look the same, talk the same, act the same, and have the same gifts. I don't want that. I already got one of me. I don't need another one. <laughs> An emphatic amen. <laughs> I'm serious though, we must have diversity. We must love it. When Paul goes through these people in Romans 16, he is thanking God. I really believe he's thanking God for the diversity that God put around him, for the individuals who filled in the gaps that he has. I want to do this because I, uh, our, I, I'm not sure how we're going to do this. Uh, our Dear Sandy, who leads every, uh, Sandy Walrod, um, took our teens up there. You know, these are great weekends and Saturday. She came home and she was just, she's just sick as can be. <laughs> she's, a, she's like, I don't know if I can. So she was going to fight through it. And I said, please relax. You know, when you go for 72 hours and no sleep, that sometimes happens. Um, I want to do this. Let's pray for Sandy right now. Let's pray more than just for her sick, for her wellness. I'm believing God has a, has a, Father, thank you. Thank you for her right now. And we agree that you've raised her up for such a time as this. Lord, have her never strive in ministry. Have her walk out the fruit of what you've deposited in her. Thank you for her. And of course, bless her as she recovers too and grant her healing. Thank you, Jesus. So I'm going to, Jeff, I'm going to have you come up. I know a couple of you kind of thought you had some things to share, but I want, I want a couple testimonies, however, two, three, whatever we do, um, I want to hear what God did because this is why. I am so thankful for individuals. And, and talking about Romans 16 has just stirred in me. Individuals are what make us us. And so Jeff has been there so many times now. And so just lead us in some testimonies. Um, first of all, I'm going to be a part of you guys cooking because you cannot be left alone. <laughs> I mean, you two left alone in the kitchen will be a disaster. I will supervise. Did everybody say amen? All right, I got it. Um, yeah, this is, I don't know how many, I think it's four years now, or close to it, at least. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, saturate, the, the speaking is, 
in the preaching and the worship is always um, beyond belief. And so even as an adult, there is so much in there you can receive. And so th there was a whole huge download that, that God put in me. The biggest thing that I want to say this morning for some of the, the youth share is, is this, is that I love this. Adam McCain, who has been a staple there for 12 years, and, and the, guy, the guy is the real deal. You know what I like? I like people that are the real deal. And, and he always brings, he knocks it out of the park, and he did again this year. He said that everybody always comes to them and him and says, what is the problem with the youth? What's the issue? What, what is the overwhelming giant that's killing the next generation? And he said, you know, um, they're surprised when I give him this because his message was about identity and purpose and who you are in Christ and knowing where you're going. He said, it's not the social media. I mean, no, that's an issue. It's not pornography. It's not drugs. It's not, he went through all the lists. He said, at the end of the day, the issue is they don't know who they are and they don't know they were called by God. So in the midst of the complexity of ministering to youth and trying to grab hold of them, sometimes we overcomplicate. We, we, we think that we have to do all these creative things, and you do at times. But at the end of the day, listen to me. When somebody, a 13-year-old, a 14-year-old, finds out that God has a call and a purpose and they get locked in, there it is. The world can't snatch them. And so that, that truth was, was so great. For me, of course, my poor kids, I'm always at these events. Maybe someday I won't. I've been trying to step away a little bit. But what an amazing thing to, you know, when they, they worship and it's a mosh pit and there they go. And I just stand back and just grin. Amen? Is there anything better than seeing your kids worship in the house of God? I mean, come on. We, we have a lot of stuff that we get irritated with and we get frustrated with. And it was really cool this year, Sophie brought a, a couple of friends. One specifically, I asked him, he was in my room, and, and he's still testing the waters, Rick. It's so funny. But he was just in the middle of this chaos, you know, bouncing and jumping and high-fiving and loving. I said, so what do you think? He goes, I don't really know yet, but it was cool. <laughs> and you know what? He doesn't have to know up here, right? What, what God does, you know, in the spirit, man, we don't even know what transpires. So, so some people were pretty new, and I think that God really touched them. So how about we have, who's, who wants to come up and share? Grace, come on up. Sophie, I know, is coming up. Aren't you? Connor, are you coming up? All right, we'll do three. Come on, we're up here real quick. And tell us what, kind of, we'll let Sophie go first, what, what God did. Um, so one really big thing that touched me was the, was it the Friday night service? Um, in the worship leading up to it, I was, like, I was doing my best to press in. The worship there was always awesome. I always come, like, expecting big things from it, but I just wasn't, like, I wasn't feeling God's presence that night, and I didn't understand why. Um, I was, like, focused. I was, like, God, speak to me, say something, and I didn't hear anything. And so I got back up to my seat, and Adam McCain started preaching, and I said, Lord, reveal to me, like, you know, where is this blockage coming from? And one thing Adam said was, one of the main reasons why people don't hear from God during worship is because they make it about them and not about God. Um, so oftentimes we're focused on, like, what God can do for us, that we've missed the whole point of worship, and that's just praising him and thanking him and just experiencing who he is, like not what he's going to come and say to us, but just worshiping him. And so that night, it's kind of, it's kind of funny, it's the night that everyone expects to cry and to sob and to go down and get prayer, but instead he taught us to like let our walls down during worship, you know, to dance, the importance of dancing and singing before God. And so every single teenager went down like after the service, and every single person was jumping and dancing, and to the point of where everyone even jumped onto the worship stage, and we were all dancing and just like celebrating. It was happy. Usually the last night isn't happy, you know? Usually you come out and like you're sobbing and you have like mascara running down your face and you look like a mess, but we all looked like a mess because we were sweating, you know? Which, it, yeah, but it was really cool. It was awesome to just 
get to celebrate with one another, you know? Yeah. All right, so, um, yeah, on, the, on Friday night, I think, um, Adam McCain's message, I really connected with it, um, and God just really humbled me because I realized that I was making worship about myself and, like, what I looked like and what I was feeling and if I was getting any emotions or anything. <laughs> and Adam McCain said that... Um, insecurity is rooted in pride and I realized that when I was insecure about raising my hands or whatever and what I looked like that I was really saying that I wasn't willing to sacrifice my pride in order to worship God to my fullest extent and I realized that sometimes I think we make worship about um, I think we confuse worship with receiving instead of just giving our all to God So this is my fourth year at Saturate, and every year I was always, any worship, even here or anything, I would never go to the front. I would never jump up and down. I never put my hands up. I would never sing. I was always, look. I would always feel like I was being looked at weird or judged or anything. But this year, I think, I don't remember which night it was, but they were talking about worship and how it's okay to just be looked at weird, and if people want to do that, they can do that. And this year, I really did that. I went up to the front, and I raised my hands, and I actually sang this year. And so this year was a decent, a big year for me, and I think I just opened up, and I talked to the guys, and I just felt really good this year, and I just felt open and not judged. Praise God. Oh, listen, this stuff is so good. And here's what I want us to see. I want us to see that as we value individual people, again, forget their age, whatever. That was a, Grace, are you 15? 15 so 15, 17, 16-year-old. Um, regardless of their, you're still 17, aren't you? Yeah. Almost 18. Almost. So we will find, we will, okay. Um, in and as we look at people, I want us to, this is my heart so much, and God's just stirring this in me. I want to look at every person and just say, thank you, Jesus, for that person. Because there's so many people that have made us who we are. We're reading Romans 16, and I could go through this, and there's just a person after person after person. And some of them we know nothing about. It's kind of cool, isn't it? Paul lists people in the Holy Scripture the best-selling book of all time, the greatest writing ever, Paul lists people that we don't know anything about. Nothing. Others we know a little bit about. There's one guy, Rufus, that he says, greet Rufus. Rufus is probably, I like this story, he's probably the little kid. So I want you to hear this when you think of young people. Remember when Jesus was going to the cross and he's carrying his cross, and he falls, and they say to that other guy, hey, you, carry the cross. Remember his name was Simon? He had two kids, Alexandra and Rufus, and they were watching. Some of you only know it through a Ray Bolt song. They watched the lamb. But this little kid, Rufus, who was at the meetings, at the Saturate conferences, right? Now, he is significant in Paul's ministry. He says in verse 13, Rufus, chosen in the Lord. Rufus is not a little kid anymore, but I bet you Rufus told the story his entire life about when he saw Jesus. The encounter, the literal encounter he had with Jesus right there in front of him. There he went, forever impacted. Sometime after Pentecost, Rufus got saved, filled with the Spirit, become a leader in the church and a strong partner with Paul. Paul could have easily said, you'll never be anything more than a rotten teenager. Or he could have embraced him. Thank God for him and said, that's a fellow worker of mine. 
one of the, there's, there's not a lot of benefits of getting older, but here's one benefit of getting older. The people you knew when they were little aren't little anymore. So now people in their 30s and 40s, the, when I, I actually have kids I coached who are 44 years old. That's weird, but it's really true. Um, I coached very young when I was coaching. And, and I did. I wasn't much older than them. But I watched them. I watch them now. And I say, thank you, God, that I invested in those kids. Because they're no longer 12. They're 38, 42, 31. They're raising kids. They have awesome kids. I'm looking around this room today. A lot of you were my teenagers. Oh, hi. Hello in the back. And over there. And good to see you. <laughs> but, but I'm telling you, you'll only see the Rufuses who are leaders of the church if you first see the Rufuses as the ones who, when they catch hold of who they are in their identity, they will be the leaders of the church. Grace, I have no problem saying of you, you are going to be one of the most amazing ladies this world has ever seen. I have no problem saying that. Total confidence. You're going to raise kids that are going to be way better than your parents' kids. And I know that's their prayer. Well, that wasn't, you know, and I'm, you know what I'm saying. I know that though, Grace. I have no problem saying that. I have no problem saying it. Whatever. Connor was up here. Connor, you're going to be one of the most, he maybe he left. I don't know. He did. He's out there counting boxes that aren't there. Um, going to be one of the most awesome guys ever. I'm going to at times, watch this, I'm going to work for a lot of these young people. I know it. I know it. But you need to have this gratitude that Paul has in Romans 16. I'm telling you, you do. Of all people, this is your homework. I want you to do your homework right now. Get out something to write on. This can be your phone. You are allowed to take out your phone and begin typing, okay? So everybody get their phones out or paper or whatever. I want everybody to do this. So, it's, you know, if you need, if you, I, have, I have a pen if somebody has paper and no pens. Sadiq has a phone if you need a phone. Here's your homework. And I really, I, if we do this, things will change. There are people in your life and look over the last, how, I don't know how, you know, if you're old, look over multiple decades. If you haven't, if you can't even remember a decade, just remember as far back as you can. But in that time, there are people, as you reflect, that you are so thankful for. So thankful for this person and that person. You, I don't know who it is. Teachers, coaches, parents, relatives, people you met in the street, whatever. Just people. You're so thankful for these people. They have helped you become who you are. This is what I want you to do. I want you to just take a few minutes here. Let's go with 10. I want you to write down 10 people, specific, real people. I want their real names. You're not handing this in. We're not going to put their names up here. This is just for you. I want you to write down 10 people. Take some time to reflect. Maybe some of you need to go back to college. A lot of the people I'm so thankful for, I'm really thankful for what they did to me in a window from about 1988 to 1995. It was a key time in my life. God sent so many people in my life during that time. Real people, write down their names. Write down people, people. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And if you have them show you people that you need to be thankful for, what we're doing is we're writing Romans 16. I want you to write your own Romans 16. Every one of his letters, Paul has somewhere in there where he gives thanks for the people he's writing to. He says in Ephesians, I thank my God every time I think about you. Every time I go before God in prayer, I thank him for you. Get these 10 people down. Got them all down your notes or whatever you type in. Send a text to yourself. I don't care. Here's what I want you to do though. This is what you gotta this is one week to do this. This week, 
take that list of 10 people and every day go before God and thank him for those people. Pray for them every day. Now, listen, because I was approached after the first service about this. Some of the people you're really thankful for have died, okay? So that's, that's good because that means you have a heritage. So obviously, you know, that's different than somebody who's sitting next to you. Um, but, 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 but then the second thing you do after praying for them, this, between now and, I don't know, I think it's reasonable between now and Wednesday, but certainly between now and next Sunday, you need to thank them for whatever you're thankful for. So you might shoot them a text and say, man, thank you for coming in my life. I'm so thankful that God put you in my life 15 years ago. You've been a real blessing. Thank you. And I thank God every day for you. Send a text. Send them whatever. Some of you still use phones. If you call somebody, call them, thank them. Um, First service, two people said they actually have written a letter before. And you can send them a letter. Whatever it is, maybe you'll see them. You need to thank these 10 people. But I I really want you to take this seriously because I'm going to show you how this is going to change things. You thank these 10 people and have, and it's a true heart. If Listen, if you're not thankful, the first thing to do is go before God and say, God, make me thankful. That's okay. That's honest. Totally honest. And let them, let them deposit in you a huge amount of gratitude for that. You know, the, these kids went to this conference. Well, gosh, a lot of people did some awful work to get you there. And you're just like, I love this. You know, Some of you remember the people who did those hard tasks to get you the great things. You say, wow, I can't, we were so mean to that adult. Thank you for putting up with us. And I am who I am today because you had grace when I was 18 years old. So I I want you to thank them. And this is why this is an important thing. There were... There's easily, let's just throw out the number because it's easily this amount. There's about 300 people here today. If 300 people literally do this, and you need to do it, not, and this is not, you need to do this. That means that we personally will thank 3,000 people over the next couple of days. Newsflash, we live in a mean world. We do. Everybody's cranky and ordinary. I don't, I don't like how hardly anybody acts. And the easiest way to fight all this yuck is to yourself be yuck. Well, all that produces is a double dose of yuck. You want to beat this? 3,000 people got a personal thank you this week. That's over 10% of our population, people. Think about that for a second. That's wild. Do you know that 1% of our regional population is here today? Wow. 10% of our population is going to get a personal thank you in the next four days. You don't think that God can do things in the spirit to shift things? Shift them. Thank you, teachers. Thank Thank your former teachers. I'll never forget the time I was... I was probably in my 20s, and my dad and I were doing some work down at a house that he owned. It's actually where you live now. And the neighbor there was super old. I don't know where she was. She was old. And she'd lived there forever. My dad lived there when he was a kid, and the neighbor there. And he goes up to Mrs. Sequist. And we're just out there, and she's just out there, you know, hobbled over or whatever. And he just out of the blue, my dad, who this was not normal for him. He just says, Mrs. Sequis, I just got to thank you. You were my Sunday school teacher in 1954. And he then went on to tell her some of the things that she taught him and how he remembered getting through this situation because of what she taught and all this stuff. Well, here's this 90-some-year-old lady just crying, right? She died sometime after that, I don't know. I don't know, but I'm just, I just remember that so clearly that what a simple thing 
I mean, she probably had all these little boys in the 50s that she was really frustrated with and wondered if any of them were going to get through fourth grade. And here they were out impacting generation after generation. Get the thank you going. Thank people. Thank them. Thank them. And I want to do this because I really believe this can happen. These 3,000 people who are going to get thanked in the next few days, let's believe God to do something in them. They're going to be prepared. God's going to get them prepared. I, I really believe this will happen. I believe there are, I, I think there's going to be a teacher out there who's ready to bag it on Tuesday. Done. Hate the system, hate the kids, hate it all. And one of you sends them a text thanking them. And they're like, oh my gosh. I'm going to go to school tomorrow and I'm going to make an impact. I want to change the spirit in our area, the atmosphere, and it will happen when out of the outflow of our heart, the abundance of our heart, the gratitude of our heart, we spill over to other people. So, so that list you have in front of you, your 10 people, that's Romans 17. That's your Romans 17 whatever it would be. Go for it. Pray for those people. Father, we pray for them. And right now, and, and there they really are. We're, we, we wrote down 3,000 people's names today. And of course, we take them before you, God. But we pray as our action says thank you that you would prepare their hearts. Father, as extreme as maybe somebody suicidal and you're going to have a message through Instagram show up and they're going to get saved. Father, give us a heart of gratitude that is so big, so big that it's undeniable. Thank you, Father. Have us look at people. Mm, just have us say thank you. And then, uh, then lastly, and I you know, and, and a lot of you too. I, you know, we have known, I, I've known thousands of people, thousands and thousands all over. You know, that you drift apart, move, you don't see each other, whatever. But I just, I want a heart that for each one of them, I want to be thankful. Each one of them. And I know this, I know this. I've, it's probably 10,000 people. You would be surprised how many people you've known over the years. It's a lot. And, and have had direct impact with. Just thank God for them. Maybe they'll show up again. Maybe they'll just pop in. I haven't seen you for 10 years. Oh, I love seeing you. Who cares what they're doing or what they did? Give thanks to God for them. He wants to, he wants to shift and work our heart on that. So you got your homework? I'm telling you, do this. We're going to hear some testimonies about this. Indeed. So here's, let me shift you to this. Because we're going to go here. Um, also be thankful for the people you have not yet seen. You know, we're going to get together this week. Not all of you are coming to the dinner, which is totally fine. You can't all come to the dinner. But we're going to, we're going to raise a lot of money. We're going to rescue a lot of young ladies. It's going to be awesome probably won't see any of them. I actually have had the privilege of seeing 50 of the girls that we have literally rescued. I have seen them. I have hugged them. I've, I've been right there. So I've seen them. I know they're real people. Most of us will never see these people. But I want us to get such a heart of thank you God for making that person. Creating that person. Jeff, you mentioned the identity. When that one of the best ways, and this is how even in our work in Kenya and India, one of the best ways you fight human trafficking is when a young lady gets a hold of their identity, they're not swept up into human trafficking. Most human trafficking is not somebody kidnapped. It's somebody who has no hope, who drifts towards anything that will give them love and a family, however false it is. So when they get a hold of their identity in Christ and their real purpose, they're not, they're not easy pickings. Not. And so, you know, get just be praying for that. So, so here's what we're going to do. I, I, don't, I don't know. We're just going to stop because I don't know how to stop. Um, but I want us to do this this week. 
as well as thanking all your people, I want you to be praying because this is a very significant weekend here. Very significant. We got great speakers coming in. Next, do not miss next Sunday, for goodness sake. And it's going to be incredible uh, what's going on here. Bring everybody you know next week and we'll have lunch afterwards. I, I need to, can I give you a really practical, I gave you a practical way to help and that is uh, to love people and that's to thank them. Here's my other practical way. Okay, you're all sitting in a chair, Okay. That chair can't be here. <laughs> We're gonna, we need to move the chairs. Uh, this, this whole room is turning into a massive banquet hall. And so, but I want us to do this. See, we're going to have fun. We're going to move the chairs. We're just going to, we're going to take your chairs, stack them up. And they're just going to the sides because, no, they're not going to the sides. They're going over there. Unhook them though. And, okay, so I guess... You, Josh, you're, you got to get rid of your chair. Sorry, um, you're out. Uh, so those go away. And we're going to move chairs and do whatever. Ann's going to come up here with the mic or whatever and instruct you. But we're turning this thing into a place where lives are rescued this week. So I want us to have some fun with this. I love you so much. And I am so stoked about what goes on. Please feel free as you're driving by to stop by. We believe at some point this week, our building actually shows up. If it's, it's, we think it's the end of this week. If not, it's the beginning of next week. The building is showing up at any day now. And so that's super cool. We're going after lives. We want to rescue a ton of lives and see people freed. And we want to thank 3,000 people this week, including you. So I love you so much. God bless you. Have an amazing week. And... Amen.